One of the things I wanted to talk about here too is um, some of the parallels between our approach to this volume, our writing, our work in the archives, um, and Bishop's own creative process. So I really see her as um, a curatorial poet. She has a curia curatorial practice around her work where she saves things. She goes back to um, her own notebooks when she's thinking about things, or she's just sort of documented these things and, and they come up again later in her, her work. So there's this constant sort of going back to these saved things in the archive, in her own practice. And so I'm wondering if you could think about ways that your own thoughts about working in the archives and writing your chapter, um, think about some of the ways that that intersects with um, Bishop's own process, creative process. I guess I'll chime in here and say that I think one of the exciting things about working in an archive um, like Bishop's is that Bishop was such an alluvial writer. So she was so recursive in her writing practice that there are all these moments in the archive in which um, things sort of fold in upon themselves in certain ways, including, I think, um, some sense of Bishop's own relationship to the archive or what we might think of as the historical record. Um, and, and for me, in looking at the drafts of In the Waiting Room, there are six extant drafts at Vassar. Um, and on the third draft, there's a, a note that she made to herself in the margin, um, very sort of magisterially, in which she says, um, I'll find something maybe better in the actual one, meaning the actual copy of the National Geographic from February 1918. And in fact, between the third and the fourth draft, we see this dramatic recasting of the poem that shows us that she did in fact, at that moment in her process, go back and read the actual magazine, incorporate all these details that would have actually made the, the poem far more political than, than it ended up becoming. But we see, we see the poet essentially negotiating between history and the imagination at that point. And for me as, as a poet and as someone who also teaches creative writing, it's a, it's a great way of sort of illuminating for students the way in which a writer was negotiating the politics of her poem, the historical record, um, her fealty to that, her imaginative license, um, in kind of a interesting, interesting way. In that sense, I think the archive uh, for a poet like Bishop is particularly rich because um, way leads on to way. And um, we can see we can see the poet working through her processes sometimes over decades, right? Um, coming back to a poem she started 26 years earlier or drafting the scene in the foster letters that recurs in a poem 15 years later. Um, and I, I particularly sort of felt myself drawn to those folds, those folds in time and process. I guess I was trying to think of your question, Bethany, and I wasn't sure like to what extent Bishop's own archival practices overlapped with Vassar's ultimate organization of the archives. I mean, I do think that also the archival work or the essays in the collection resulted to some extent also from putting together things that Bishop either didn't particularly prioritize herself or um, see as speaking to her poetry, but interpreting it and incorporating it into, you know, her idea of herself as a poet, as a professional poet, like in Claire Seiler's um, essay, looking at uh, Douglas's uh, essay, you know, he really focuses on things she dabbled in and wasn't even very successful at, um, but how those related to her major works. So I felt like in the poetry drafts, it was interesting and productive to see Bishop's own archival process. But in other ways, I think our collective work was also to kind of make the archives 
in our own image and kind of put things together that weren't maybe necessarily meant to be uh, cross fertilizing each other in Bishop's own mind. So maybe both of those were productive in different ways. I was going to say the emphasis on queer and sort of we're in this moment where it's like actually queer has changed a lot and queer is moving into some new place that isn't really even I don't I don't think it's in focus yet but um but bringing that as you're saying you know, to to the archive is is definitely like trying to see see things adjacent to next to beside or whatever um her practice that actually wouldn't have been identifiable even by her to a certain extent. So it's like, it's seeing the historical moments differently such that it sets the historical figure off in a different way. I was gonna say something along those lines, which is just the, the question of self archiving becomes really interesting with Bishop. I was looking at letters that she never intended to have archived. They, they were handed over to Vassar 30 years after the original set, set of materials that, that was given to Vassar in 1981. And so the, um, these letters were, you know, kept in a locked safe and only only available. Someone was going to throw them out and, and kind of accidentally discovered them. So Bishop meant for these to stay private. Um, and so there's there's kind of some a different set of questions there. But the way I think about it is that um, it it may not, you know, th these letters that that I'm looking at are uh, kind of some of the queer elements in the archives challenge the ways that um, that queerness can be erased. And so we're, we're doing this act of recovery. But they also highlight some of the ways that queerness is ephemeral and is material. And so um, the, my, my letters are, are less uh, less connected to how to Bishop's writing practices, but they're, they're very much in line, or my archival practices are very much in line with how Bishop conducted her relationship, which was a relationship conducted via letters for the long times that she was in Brazil and her partner was in Massachusetts. Um, very material in the ways that they're sending each other objects and artifacts that are meant to be cut out and you know little, little gifts or little um, little little uh, tiny tiny gifts that are inserted into the envelopes and things like that and then the ways in which they would um, kiss the letters or cry on the letters or sleep with the letters in bed next to them um, mm -hmm. and make the letters a proxy for the for the person so for me to be looking at a letter that I know that Bishop's partner you know slept with at night it just it like made her alive <laughs> in this way that I think is even transcends what what was going on in her poems um, which is terribly exciting. I think for me too, one of the interesting things is, is realizing that, um, as we know, Bishop was not always the most reliable narrator about her own creative process. And, um, you know, when she spoke about in the waiting room in interviews, particularly with um, George Starbuck in 1977, she was quite insistent on the fact that, to, to the best of her recollection, she had basically used only the materials that she remembered from the National Geographic magazine, which um, the archive makes makes clear that that's, that's not entirely true. And she was taking quite a bit of license and um, had in fact misremembered um, some of the geographies and misplaced some of the indigenous people that she is referencing in that poem. Um, so the poet's own relationship to the way in which she spoke about her process, I think comes into question not in a way that we want to say falter for, but in a way that just sort of complexifies or complicates um, uh, how we understand her process and how these um, these polished poems came into being. Um, so that for me as, as a poet, is also really interesting that there may have been things that she wasn't even necessarily conscious of. Um, my big sort of exciting moment or epiphany in the archive was realizing that while there are these six drafts of in the waiting room, there is a way, a very legitimate way, I think, of reading the Foster letters from the late 1940s as an, in some respects an early draft of that poem because it also features a scene of reading an older adult female with whom she shares a vocalization. It also concerns a reverie in a dentist's office. Um, so the settings um, are also um, congruent. And in fact, that scene of reading also involves in the Foster letters, a book about indigenous people who are wearing, um, in her letters, she says, sexual decorations. So a lot of the sort of trace elements of that poem appear decades earlier in an analyst, a letter to an analyst, which I think raises another interesting question um, as scholars, which is to what extent do we regard 
those passages of the Foster Letters as in fact a draft um, that should be read alongside or considered alongside what's actually in the folder that's labeled drafts. Um, so there's some questions I think of, of how to categorize archival materials when these connections or overlaps come to the fore. Yeah, in fact, there's also in those, in the letters to Ruth Foster, there's also um, the beginnings of um, the moose as well, which was, you know, written 30 years later. And so it's, I mean, there, there are at least two poems that have an and, early- And one art. Yes, and one art as well. Yes, yeah, so- Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Because yeah. the references in one art lead you to believe that it's a poem entirely about Lota because it mentions losing the continent. Uh, but then in the dra in, in a letter she wrote to Meth Vessel begging her, you know, to, to get back with her during a brief period when they were broken up. She starts dropping in lines that show up later in one art. And, and so it's like she's spontaneously writing the poem in the middle of the letter. Uh, it gives you great fodder for getting like really mad at the new Bishop movie when like one art is just portrayed as being about Lota only. It's super fun. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that's fascinating, too, because I think um, in an interview in 1978 to, with Elizabeth Spires, Bishop says that she'd always wanted to write a Villanelle um, and that one art came to her quite easily. It was like writing a letter. Um, so, I mean, in fact, she had she had been writing that poem in letters. But then there's like 10 drafts. So it's like it did not come easily. Like, come on. <laughs> exactly. And then she had to go to Frank Bedart to get one of her central rhymes, um, although neither Frank nor nor Bishop could remember which one it was. So the art of losing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The art of forgetting, too. 